Hello out there, I'm Alex Wurz and you're listening to Beyond the Grid. Hello everyone, Tom Clarkson here with your latest fix of Beyond the Grid, presented by Bose QuietComfort 35.2 wireless headphones. My guest this week is one of the busiest and most interesting people in motorsport. He runs a bunch of different businesses these days, but there was a time when he existed purely to compete, first on two wheels and then on four. I'm talking about Austrian racer Alex Wurz. Two wheels, I hear you say. Yes, believe it or not, he was a BMX world champion before then setting sail on a motorsport career that saw him race in Formula One with Benetton, McLaren and Williams, and he scored three podium finishes. So whether it was dicing with Michael Schumacher or trying to stay on the right side of Flavio Briatore or dealing with the tribulations of being one of the tallest drivers on the grid or walking away from the fastest crash in F1 history, Alex has done all this and more. But it's what he's done post-racing in F1 that's almost just as interesting. Designing tracks, working as an advisor for Williams, and heading the Grand Prix Drivers Association, which is currently involved in the 2021 rules discussions. I've known Alex for years, and unsurprisingly, this was a chat that just kept flowing from one interesting topic to another. When I checked the recording back, I could barely believe that we'd been speaking for an hour and a half. So sit back and enjoy hearing from one of the most intelligent and articulate men in Formula One. Alex, welcome to Be On The Grid. Lovely to have you on the show. Now, I think you're the busiest man, not just in Formula One, but in motor racing. So I was wondering if we could start this podcast with you telling me what the last three weeks have been like for you. Hi Tom. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Very privileged to be on on the podcast with you. We know each other very long. It's always cool to chat to you. Uh, the reason I answer a little bit longer and not direct is because, to be honest, I forgot what happened in the last three weeks. It all blends <laughs> into one big journey, a very interesting journey where I'm well past the transition of being a race driver into full business, growing my own business. But if I really think about the last three weeks, I spent them mainly in the Middle East for my track design business, which is growing like crazy. So in you're designing a track in the Middle East at the moment? Uh, various tracks, to be honest. Um, I would think in, in race track design, I'm the new kid on the block. Uh, I mean, we can talk about the race track design, how it all came about, um, maybe later throughout the chat. But at the moment, I'm fully in love and invested mentally with every single bit of my emotion in, in, in track designing. Not only in the racetracks themselves, also the architecture, building synergies, and actually seeing where we have been flat and sideways for the sport. Um, give you a small example. Um, most of the tracks, we have the bedock on the inside, where all the interesting stuff is, the high tech is, where the superstars are. Then we have 12, 20 meters of asphalt, both sides a very ugly looking massive fence separating the action with the fence. And this is wrong in motorsport, you know, the fence should be above, above us. And in my tracks, they will be literally above us or beside us and mingle with us. Of course, I understand that Formula 1 Bedock is an exclusive zone and, uh, and the promoters want to keep a separation, but we have to be much closer to each other. You know, it, it, it's a sport we all love. The fans who watch it should have equal entertainment and right and being close to the action, to the cast, to the stars. And I can manage that without breaking the rules of F1 now, which is the Better Club is exclusive. And I have all of these concepts and the desire to really uh, move the industry forward from what I call a 15 years of stagnation in racetrack design. Just look at you, the passion on your face when you're talking about racetrack. Have you always been interested in design and architecture? And if you hadn't been coming up through the ranks when all your mates were at university, is it the sort of thing that you would have read, do you think, at, at uni or at school? Yeah, now you mentioned it, I almost forgot it, but I remember before I went to a technical school, uh, so you have been to school, a racing driver who's actually <laughs> been to school. <laughs> uh, yes, I know. It's a good story about school. But uh, I ended up going to a technical college uh, to learn about engineering, vehicle dynamics engineering. Uh, but originally, I wanted to go to an art school. 
and I was too young to qualify for the art school. So then I thought, okay, my other passion is motor racing. I want to be a driver and I know it will help me in the future. So I went to vehicle dynamics school. I didn't finish it because motor racing became too important and um, got basically fired from school because I was never there. Let's be honest. <laughs> never did your homework. <laughs> and um, yeah, but uh, designing is always my passion. Maybe you remember my helmet design. It came about that I ended up painting and airbrushing my own uh, helmets because no one could exactly paint the helmet like I wanted it. I have this design which is a bit crazy to some, um, but it was my design. As a kid, I designed over 120 different helmet designs until I had that one. So had you always designed your own helmets? The design itself, yes, yeah. came for me, but someone else painted it. But then I got so cranky that no one understood how I want to have the exact details that the only option left was to learn how to airbrush. When did you learn? In uh, a long time ago. <laughs> Some people who listen might not have been born. But it was around 2000, 2001. I mean, do, do you have any sort of like heroes in the helmet design world? Like, was it Sid Mosca who used to paint Senna's helmets? No, nah, no heroes there. I, it's always my way and my only way and my only design. Um, everyone goes on horizontal lines. I thought, no, I don't want that. I want to have different sort of signature on my helmet. And it started basically with a sponsor of mine in, in, in my childhood when I was BMX racing. I had Adidas as my sponsor. And they had, a, had sort of these three stripes with some zigzag. And so I kept that zigzag design and that then ended up to be my element of helmet designs. I put in the red, white, red flag on the front. It's yellow, which is the sunrise. On the back is the yellow in a different shape, which is sunset. On the bottom of the green, which is the earth. On the top is blue with a spiral inside, which is a stormy sky. So uh, that's basically the elements of my helmet. How do you feel about drivers nowadays changing their designs the whole time? Well, they can't actually. They're now not allowed to. But, I mean, Vettel went through a, f a period, didn't he, of new helmet design every race? Yeah, actually, I think the rule is not really fair on drivers that we have to stick to one helmet design because the rule says everyone has to have the same personality all the time. And I, f I find it interesting that some people want to display a different helmet design every race weekend because... They are inspired by a certain moment in life, and if that changes every week, then we should know about that, if you're interested in it. I personally, I would never change my helmet design, maybe adjust it to the sponsor, or maximum a one-off, but that already would bug me. So I would keep my signature, my identity, throughout my whole career. A bit like Senna did, so um, don't compare myself to someone as great as Senna, but I would have never changed my helmet design. I had to fight really hard with uh, Ron Dennis, uh, McLaren team boss, over my helmet design because it played havoc to his mind that uh, all these colors and lines which are not exactly like his sponsor lines. So, uh, <laughs> My opinion is I don't like that rule. I would, in any case, never change my helmet design. Yeah, how interesting. Now look, you touched on BMX racing then because a lot of people listening to this may not be aware that you... Uh, it, back in 1986, so what, you were 12, I think, at the time. BMX world champion. Now, I don't even know what BMX racing involves. So can you educate me? And, and what did it do for you and, and your racing career? Yeah, so BMX racing is small bikes, 20 inch, uh, and eight people start over a course with a few bumps and jumps. It is now an Olympic sport, super sensational sport. You had a starting gate. Starting lights, eight guys just race for around 30 to 40 seconds. So an explosive sport and you end up with your heart rate beating well over 200. In my case, I reached 222 beats during the races when we started recording it. Uh, so you have to be extremely fit. You have to train each and every day. International as well, obviously? No, obviously international yeah. when you run a world championship and How far uh, did Olympic you go? Games. How far did you travel? Uh, in f mainly in Europe, but there were also races in Brazil and Japan. But as a 12-year-old, I traveled many times with just friends. My, my parents were very busy. I just hitchhiked the lift with other BMX racers. It was a sensational time of my life to have no problems to actually have a sponsor. I had two sponsors, the Aut Astronaut the Mobile Club and uh, Adidas. They paid for it. I had a trainer. Um, 
I learned about nutrition. But the most important thing I learned in life is if you're not the one who starts pedaling last at the jump and starts pedaling first after the jump, you will not achieve anything in life. So each and every day I had my routine. I watched the Rocky movie, you know, the <laughs> music <motivated>. inspired me <laughs> in the winter when there was deep snow in the Austrian mountains. I went out like Rocky Balboa. I ran in the deep snow with stones and woodlocks on my shoulders just to get more leg power, to explode out of the gate. Did my riding on slippery surfaces as well to, to learn bike skills. And I remember then going to the first international races and I was on the front and it's like, wow, this is cool, you know. Was there anything on the BMXs that helped you in your motor racing career? Things like, I don't know, is it balance? And I mean, as you say, there's the mentality thing you just talked about. Was there but actually anything to do with riding that helped you? Interesting one, but then it's sport philosophy that anyone who understands and feels about speed in a race car, you will find mostly they have also good balance. Is it awareness of motion? I don't know, but what it definitely uh, helped me was fitness. And I can later tell you that at my first few tests in either the Le Mans car or in a Formula One car, my fitness was one of the key parts why I succeeded and got contracts. And that was down to BMX because I loved being fit, I loved the hard training aspect. And I continued all the way until today to train very hard. You get a bit addicted to it, but I realized it gives me an advantage at certain times. Wow. And so how did the car thing come about? I mean, I know that it's in your family with, with your, your dad friends and all the rally cross and things. So it was always there in the background. But when did you then think, that's what I want to do? So um, back then in Austria, karting wasn't very popular. I was fully emerged into the BMX racing. Um, but at the same time, my dad, who was a three times European champion in rallycross, um, so I grew up on the racetracks and I always wanted to be a race driver, but we didn't have a big karting scene in Austria at the time. So to be honest, very naive at the time, I thought I can only start racing with the age of 18 when you make the driving license, because for a racing license back then you needed the driving license in Austria. Other countries like England, Brazil, they already had racing licenses from age of 16. So quite late in my career, I've seen a go-kart uh, and a magazine. And I would run to my dad and said, hey, father, I don't have to wait until I'm 18. I can do this, you know. <laughs> and um, what did he say? <laughs> he said, kind of cranky. He said, OK, well, I guess I have to check out how we can find <laughs> such a go-kart. And then um, just by pure chance and luck, uh, my father had this uh, driver training centers and facilities and someone who owned the go-kart said, ah, can I run in my engine here on your testing center? And then my, my dad said, yeah, yeah, feel free to come, but could my kid do a, a test lap, you know? So I did my first run in a go-kart and from that moment on, I took my BMX bike, uh, put it into the garage, went to buy a helmet and want to go karting and that was it. And, and firstly, was it, it was a eureka moment for you. It was like, it was like a lightning bolt. When you, the moment you first drove that car. Yes, but the eureka moment was, I can start my motor racing career earlier than, than I thought. And I instantly understood karting is, is amazing to train my skills. I then, of course, uh, researched of where those races are, seen that international racing scenes. And um, it was a, a point where I knew with 15 or 14 at the time, 15, I can start racing and uh, start what I really wanted to do all the time to become a professional race driver. But you must have struggled in karting because, well, what are you now? You're one meter 86 now. So I don't know what you were like as a 14 year old. Uh, and you must have had chunky thighs because of the cycling. So you must have been too big, too heavy for karting or not? Not, uh, not far too much, but yes, you're right. In the end, I was too tall, uh, a bit too heavy especially in karting in the junior series. So whenever it was very cold or wet, when the weight disadvantage is much less, um, that's when I was able to win races. But uh, in karting was very difficult. Funny story, I went to the European Championship race with Giancarlo Fisichella as my teammate, that factory team So one race of mine in the wet and said, oh, he's good because I won the race. So they gave me this chance to be in that uh, European Championship race. 
the day we arrived, they announced that the minimum weight is really low. So basically I was 17 kilos overweight, which is just a no-go. It's like sending a marathon runner with a 50 kilo or 20 <laughs> kilo <laughs> rucksack. And the guy on the weighing skill in Le Mans, he, the first time he put me on, he checked if I have anything on the go-kart and if I maybe misread the rules. He started laughing and he never weighed me again because he said, this guy can never be underweight. Uh, anyway, uh, never mind. Cutting was very good to get the racing instinct, to learn about the, uh, you know, racing tactics, setup work and all of that stuff, which is more, very important for racing. Now, I remember seeing you in Formula 3 at Donington. I'm trying to think what year that would have been. Uh, you were supporting the ITC, was it called the ITC Championship? The inter it's sort of International DTM Championship. Um, and I remember you were very quick, but even at that stage, it was obvious that you were much, I mean, how much bigger than Fizzy were you, for goodness sake, Giancarlo Fisichella? Yeah, I mean, uh, one and a half heads, but in terms of weight, it was uh, almost 20 kilos. So I mean, back, then in F, back then in F3, there was no driver weight included. So being heavy was a real disadvantage, yeah. but in retrospect, I don't call it a disadvantage because you have to invent a tense which isn't there in terms of laws of physics of someone being lighter and uh, it just had to be more, more precise. But to be honest, weight and size has always been a, a massive factor against me or other race drivers who have this uh, uh, handicap of being tall and heavy. But Alex, how tough was the journey for Formula One, to, to Formula One for you, because of all these disadvantages? Well, to you be had to keep inventing to honest, these tents or whatever. It, it's hard to say tough um, in a philosophical way when you see how tough life is for other people out in the world. But tough in a sporting sense, yes, absolutely. But to go to F1, which from so many thousands of people around the world, only ever 20 to 22 a year manage, of course that's tough because you are against the best in the world. Being then tall and heavy was an extra burden, so I had to f maybe just work harder and find out uh, my niches. And my niche was definitely that uh, I focused much more on setup work, on bringing feedback, working with the engineers and the technicians to deliver a better race car and a better setup and such to overcome the deficit of weight. And then when you went and raced in touring cars for Opel, how tough was that? Did you feel at that moment the dream of Formula One was slipping away? Well, in, in, in that whole process, there were nearly every season because for my family, we'd be, we're not blessed with massive money. Um, we, my, my dad was very clever on helping me to find sponsors, but we never had enough money to go really crazy. Um, so every year of, of this period, I, I knew uh, my racing career is finished. So sometimes... Did you, did you think that at the end of every year? I don't know what I'm doing next Absolutely, year. yeah. So I saw myself as driver instructor in my, in my dad's business, which is by God a great business, a great job to teach other people how to drive safely on the road. But, of course, not when you want to be a race driver. And um, after being very dominant in Formula Ford, where I think there was a year I'd done over 40 races, and I had 22 victories, 28 pole positions, uh, 36 podiums, uh, dominated the German Championship, which was one of the strongest. I won the European Formula Ford Cup. Then went to F3. First year in the team of Dr. Marco was a learning year. Second year, nearly won the German championship. Lost it with complete stupidity. Um, I think there's a story there. What do you mean? Story. <laughs> uh, and then no money. And it's like, oh my God, what am I doing now? So basically in January, someone calls me up and says, ah, I have a, from, from Opel, a manufacturer in Europe. In England it's called Vauxhall. I don't know if you have those brands in anywhere else in the world. Never mind a German manufacturer. And they said, we have this old car and Austria is an important market for us and TV will broadcast it if we have an Austrian. So could you drive, you know? And it was not my dream to go into touring cars because I want to be a single seat racer and want to be a fun racer. But I had nothing, to be honest. I had nothing else. So I took this seat in a three-year-old car and they told me that we'll always have uh, B-spec tires 
because the new tires, the new generation tires will always go to the top four drivers. But anyway, I had nothing else, so I, I took this role. Quite frustrating. No, not? not frustrating, but as a sportsman or an ambitious person, you, you don't give up. You see there's an opportunity, and that's what I did. I went there, it's like, okay, it's still a factory team, so if I'm doing a good job, maybe in the year after, I will progress into a higher role. So I remember I just said, okay, you know what? Uh, it's really a bad car. And they told me, they felt a bit embarrassed that uh, I had to use this car, the Team Just, uh, which is one of the most successful racing teams in the Le Mans 24-hour race. Well, come on to that. Exactly. <laughs> You're very clever, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> and... I said, you know, I'm going to almost live there. I will be every day in the factory. I will go with the mechanics for a beer. I will uh, tell them that I love working on the cars. Um, I, I looked what the team bosses' hobbies are, so I tried to speak about it with them just to get under the skin, hoping to get a new set of tires, a better engine, a better car. And that worked throughout the season. And uh, gave me one of my key moments, which well, gave me a Le Mans test. Exactly. And so you think you got that Le Mans drive because of all the work you'd done at the back of the grid, effectively, in, in the Opel DTM? A million percent, Tom. Uh, without having played all this game, not the game, it was my passion to, to impress the people, just to get somewhere I wanted to be. Uh, Reinhold just said, it's like, look, you're working hard, we love you to pieces, and I I know he loves Le Mans, so do I. As a childhood, it was one of my dream races. The sports cars, super cool, very heroic form of racing. And I knew he has these amazing sports cars in his collection. And then at one point, because he felt so warm to me, he said, look, I'll show you my secret project, which was developing a, a sports car to go for the overall win in the 24-hour race of Le Mans. And uh, he, he showed me his garage where they are preparing it. And then I just asked him if I can sit in it, you know. And I was sitting in it. And he saw that I feel like a kid who has birthday and Father Christmas coming at the same time. And just by luck, two weeks later, someone of his squad, he had already signed all the drivers, got ill. And they had an endurance test, which is you're testing the car over 24 hours to test its reliability and its fitness for the, such a strong race. And he called me because I was the first person coming in mind. And all of these six months of hard work, of being in his face, going under his skin, came up that moment when he said, who should I call? Ah, I called this young kid who does a good job in the touring car and loves it. And uh, that was an, I knew that was my chance. And so you tested the car and then never got out of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I tested the car and uh, it was maybe the best... Uh, performance I've ever done in motor racing <laughs> because I arrived in the track in Barrica at 10 o'clock in the evening it was winter it was pitch black dark I didn't know the track I didn't know the car a second driver felt really bad with food poisoning so he, the team boss said oh, can you already start driving now I said guys I don't know the track I, do, I don't have a seat so we done a seat and then in a little bit past midnight I did my first run and in the third lap, I did the fastest lap time of the whole test so far, which normally is completely insane. I still don't know how I did it. The team checked the data if I did a shortcut in a chicane or something. <laughs> they couldn't believe it. And uh, then they, they said, OK, you come for the next test. I came for another test. Still as a substitute only for that one person who was um, ill for uh, two weeks. I again, was the fastest. And then he put me in the car. Um, what an amazing Lucky story. But see, what did winning Le Mans in that car do for your career? Uh, again, you can see how lucky you are. In a, you in make a, your own luck. I think that's what your, that's yes. the moral of this story, isn't it? Yeah, well, thank you. I, I, I'm just thinking it was in a way lucky. But of course, I still dreamt of the big career in F, F1 and wanted to go there. So I pushed myself right in front of Flavio Briadore one day. This is after Le Mans. No, no, it was still before I ah. won the Le Mans ah. race. And he kind of didn't know what to do with me. He knew me from, from Formula 3. He said, I, I watched you, but you were stupid to lose the championship with a personal battle against someone who didn't matter. And basically to finish the meeting, he said, so what are you doing now? In his typical cranky voice. And I said, ah, next week I race in Le Mans. 
and literally to get out of the conversation, if you win Le Mans, I'll give you a test. And he walked off. And on Monday after I won the Le Mans race, the week after, uh, a fax. I'm not sure if people know what a fax was. <laughs> sort of an old-fashioned form of an email. Came in and uh, here was my first Formula 1 test. So the Le Mans race and this whole thing, just one thing fell into the other to give me, without any money, attached um, my first chance in F1. How fantastic. So where did that Benetton test take place? Uh, it took place in Estoril. Um, Had you been there before? Haven't been there before, <laughs> but I realized... Doesn't seem to prevent you doing good lap times. <laughs> no, no, but <laughs> tell us a little bit how I think and work. So I realized... I made a tiny little bit of money in Le Mans uh, after with some sponsor appearances and talks. And I had this chance of a two-day test, which Flavio gave me, against Giancarlo Fisichella. I think Paul Tracy was there, Jano Trulli was there. So it was a shootout to be a reserve and test driver for the Benetton team. For 1997? For 1997, exactly. And then I realized I don't know the track haven't been in a single-seater for a while, haven't been in any such strong single-seaters. So with that little money I made, that only paid for half of the costs for a Formula 3000 test. I went to a Formula 3000 team, which are race cars a little bit slower than Formula 1. Uh, David Sears was his name. I said, David, you need to give me the best price possible, but I will test on, uh, I think it was Thursday and Friday in Estoril. And the day before... I want you to drive a car down. I want 50 laps in the 3000 car to get myself mentally ready for that F1 car. And I said, we have to take all the ballast out of the car, you know, just to be as close as possible to Formula 1 speed. Um, every cent I had, I, I offered him and he said, okay, I will still lose maybe a little bit of money, especially if you do that damage. I said, okay, I will pay it after. I don't have it now, but somehow I will make it work. He shook my hand, he drove down the car, I did 50 laps, and it was the best investment of my life. Because the next day, when I jumped into the F1 car, again, within three to five laps, I was on the same speed than the permanent drivers. And uh, it made the difference in the opinion of, of the engineers to then choose me against Fisichella and, and all those other guys. Wow. And so, how much of a step up was the Benetton from that F3000 car? Actually, it felt... Don't get me wrong, it felt like a step down because the F3000 car was extremely difficult to drive. Uh, the engine drivability was a disaster. And the lap times were maybe only two, three seconds slower than F1 at the time. So very close with a really difficult car to drive. Then I went into the F1 car and everything worked much better. It was designed to perfection. You know, at the time, Benetton was still at one of the top teams unfortunately on the way down at the wrong time to join them but the F1 car felt like a comfortable pair of jeans you put on you know and I instantly felt happy and 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 loved it more fascinating stuff from Alex in just a moment but I want to take some time now to talk to you about facial hair and shaving Harry's have a special offer for Beyond the Grid listeners offering a trial set for £3.95. All you have to do is go to harrys.com forward slash F1 podcast. Now, if you're a regular listener, then you'll know that I've got one of these Harry's sets myself and they're definitely worth checking out if you want to switch up your grooming regime. And it's so simple to arrange. Just enter your details online and you'll get a neat little package delivered to your door with all you need to get going, including a weighted ergonomic handle ensuring maximum comfort and grip while you shave and five precision engineered blades and a lubricating strip and a trimmer blade. Don't forget, you'll also get a foaming shave gel to keep your skin looking good in the summer and a handy little travel blade cover to protect your kit that just slots straight on. In your bag and off you go. So get started shaving with Harry's today by claiming your trial set for £3.95. Support our podcast and get your trial set delivered to you by going to harrys.com forward slash F1 podcast right now. That's harrys.com forward slash F1 podcast. Now let's get back to Alex. So you've got the test ride. You then obviously do a lot of testing. So how did the Canadian Grand Prix debut come about in 97? Yep. So after those first tests in the winter of end of 96, started testing. Um, the birth of that car, of the 97 car, was not great. 
Bennett fell behind clearly against the competition of McLaren and Ferrari. So the drivers at the time, Gerhard Berger, fellow Austrian countrymen, as well as Sean Lazy, they were not so happy with the tests and uh, you know they were used to to teams like Ferrari and McLaren. So they were not very happy. But me, young little chap, knowing how to play the game, I was, again, I was at the team. I, I really tried to learn as much as possible. And the tests were good. We developed special differential system, diff, power steering. Uh, all things I learned before in my touring car days. Engineers were very happy. And then Gerhard Berger fell ill. And they called me up. But still, Flavio only gave you the nod, like, very late in the day. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, well, no. It was very late in the day. Uh, I nearly didn't see the nod because he called me uh, into his apartment in, in London. In London, right. And I rang the doorbell. I was a bit nervous because he called me basically out of a race I was doing for Mercedes as a factory driver for Mercedes-Benz sports cars. He said, I have to come and he made it clear that I have to come to the apartment in London. Well, so it wasn't a regular thing? You weren't regularly going to Flavio's place no, in London? No, absolutely no, okay. not regularly going to Flavio's <laughs> apartment, knew, just you, to make that clear. <laughs> you, you knew something was up. <laughs> something was up. Um, so, nervous, ringing doorbell, opening the doorbell, his butler, then said, ah, Flavio's in the, in the uh, living room. And I walk in and he's just in this silk leopard skin type of bathrobe <laughs> not well done up and he sits on the sofa and says sit down <laughs> and that was an image unfortunately <laughs> I cannot forget but you sat opposite him <laughs> <laughs> I had to <laughs> and so what did he say? Uh, he made it very clear he said Alex are you ready to race? and this moment I realized what's happening uh, I said I'm as ready as I can be after 2,793 test kilometers because I kept track of all the mileage I've done. And he says, well, uh, you better be ready because here's a ticket. It was a Concorde ticket. He said, you land in New York, a private jet will pick you up, fly you to Canada, and you will race this weekend. And uh, here we start take, uh, take on the option for you to, to race, to step it up as spare driver. And that was on a Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday, I jumped in the Concorde, Super cool flight. On the way there, I didn't know anything about the track. I bought the Autosport magazine because it said fantastic Canada Grand Prix review. Oh, preview. So I learned about the track, you know, and read something about it because uh, there was no YouTube at the time to learn onboard cameras. And how did this... Because oh, you were replacing Gerhard Berger, a bit of an Austrian hero. The young whippersnapper comes in, also Austrian. How was it? received at home in Austria. Yeah, you're right. You know, we're in, we're in Austria. From Jochen Rind to Niki Lauda winning the World Championship. Every race since uh, Live TV is there. Austria is Live TV. We had many Formula 1 drivers. So we are a Formula 1 nation. Then it was a little bit tricky that one Austrian replaces the next. But anyway, initially from the whole public, I had great support, you know. Uh, because they knew me also from, from times before and winning Le Mans and, and the BMX World Championship and having been a little bit of a public figure. But then there was maybe a little bit sand put into the relationship gearbox between Gerhard and myself. A, of course, he doesn't want to be replaced. B, I did well in his replacement. C, I'm Austrian. So it was already tricky for him to digest it, which is completely normal. Um, but then also he had a little bit of standoff um, with myself and the management over some strange topics which was just got lost in translation. And then maybe there was a bit of lobbying where it didn't really help me, where some of the media got quite tough, especially in races, which didn't go so well. Um, and that was a lesson for me for life because not only did I have to learn that some people don't always wish you the best. But until this moment in sport, my brain was always crystal clear on target and nothing clouded this target. And this is how I felt whilst BMX racing, whilst going to Le Mans, whilst even being with um, maybe not so good material in, in the Turing Cup Championships. But 
the mindset was crystal clear. And for a sportsman, this is just the key for success and progress. And then this whole media palaver really started to get into my brain. Before it did so, I, I entered really well in F1, you know, from, from within the third race, being on the podium in Silverstone, out qualifying a r really highly rated uh, uh, teammate. And then first season 98, still very good, you know. And then the media started to hammer in because of this bit of politics and, and lobbying, and I was not used to it, and it, it was a weakness of mine that my cloud suddenly got cloudy, I can only call it. And I lost that crystal clear focus on the driving. And you cannot afford that in the world of Formula One. How did that affect you in the cockpit then? You, you don't realize until you think, hey my God, why is it, why do I struggle now against the team boss, a uh, teammate, you know, whilst my first year with Fisichella I was clearly faster. I scored more points. I was ahead in the championship and he was seen as the new superstar. And then that whole political landscape broke all over me. Within the team? Yes, within the, within the Austrian media, from, from all of this tension being built up. But then equally, I have to be honest, that at the time, Flavio put a lot of pressure on me to also sign him as uh, my manager, which I would have done. But between a lot of miscommunication, then he started to put me under enormous pressure to sign a contract with him. And I then got so angry and cranky and said, okay, under these terms, the way you put it, I'm not signing. And Who then, was your manager? Or were you doing your own things? No, I had a manager. I had a manager, his name was Peter. He helped me in F3 to find some money and, uh, and I kept him as, as my manager. And then... It's not his fault, it was the whole situation just broke a little bit. And uh, it, 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 it really uh, stopped my progress in, in the year 99 and I, I performed much worse than, than all the years before. So do you think if you had signed with Flavio, the story might have a different ending? Um, probably, but you know, I, I, I tell you, so Flavio said I should sign with him as manager. And I would have because I understood he is a key figure in F1, you know. Don't get me wrong. Um, and I said, I have a management contract. The management contract says it's exclusive. I'm a loyal person. But anyway, I pay you the percentage you're asking on top of him. So please speak with him. You agree the, the terms. You make the agreement. I will just sign because I'm here to focus on the race. Somehow he was not very organized. It took three races. And it was my third race in my career. Very funny. I'm not funny. Listen to that. Is in the morning of the race, he said, "I'm not racing. I'm fired because I don't sign with him." Okay, which race is your third? It's my third of Silverstone. Oh my God! So, oh right, it's yeah. the first podium. My first podium. In yeah. the <laughs> but in the morning, <laughs> yeah. I was crying. I was literally crying because the team boss told me I'm fired because I haven't signed with him. It was a bit rough in those days. So then the technical director, Beth Simmons, hears the shouting going on in the motorhome and storms in and says, what's happening here? Of course, Alex, you're racing. You, Flavio, you stop all of that. You go in the car and, and race because we have a chance to be on the podium. So by that time, I remember, I would have signed with him, but he didn't manage to put the paperwork in place. I did my race, I finished third, I come back, and then the secretary of Flavio said, hey, Alex, you're very lucky. And I said, I'm not lucky, the team screwed me on the on the pit stop, I could have been second, so my teammate was second, I'm not happy, this is not lucky. And she says, no, Flavio, he was uh, asked to leave the team by the, Lodge, by the Benetton family, but she knew I didn't sign, and basically he was fired. And she considered that lucky that I didn't sign part of my money away. And I said, ah, okay, I, I, I didn't know. So basically during the race, he left. And I had the intention to sign with him because he was a sensational person to get the best out of you. You know, he really knew how to motivate you. Maybe like I've never seen anyone before. How would he do that? Let's talk about that later. <laughs> but anyway, so I didn't sign. A year later, he comes back as my team boss and then demanding still all of that money, which I haven't signed. And then we've fallen out. And then all the 
the media storm, the Flavio problem, uh, it was overwhelming for me as a young kid. And then my sporting performance started to crumble in, in, in 99. On top of it, the car was overweight and it was just too much to, to keep the focus clean. But Alex, t I'm interested because, you know, Flavio Briatore did a very good job for Mark Webber. I know that. Mark's um, very loyal to him. And I think him and Fernando Alonso, they've... they've how did he motivate you? What, I've always, I'm quite fascinated by Flavio Briatore. You say he was good at motivating drivers. How did he do that? The way he talked to you... Was it threats? No, no, it wasn't no. threat. It, it was a right mix of uh, carrot and stick character. And he adjusted. You know, in, in, in this was sensational. And whilst I had difficulties at the time, I have my full respect. Every time I see him now, I really enjoy being with him because he's an inspirational personality. Um, and because he was so good of reading everyone he talked to very quickly. He read you. He knew where he, where you soften up. He knew where you have your, your weak spot. And he used that in Formula One so incredibly well, you know. He's not technical, um, but he got this people feel. And uh, it was extremely cool that in the morning he came to you, he talked to you, and you left the meeting just feeling pumped up. You know, and, and that was Flavio, that was his strength. That's, I think, how he managed to build with the Benetton team, with Michael Schumacher, uh, all of those great, great engineers which came out of there. Uh, all of them learned a lot from, from Flavio. Now, you talk about 98, and I just got this vision of you coming out of the tunnel at Monaco with not very many wheels on your wagon, um, having just... <laughs> you and Schumacher were all having a right ding-dong, and... Massive shunt. I want to talk to you. There's two shunts I want to talk to you about. That one, first of all. Yeah. So, 98, I finished a few times uh, fourth, which from uh, underdog team was sensational. Uh, came to Monaco very fast. Um, was on the way to P2. Second, only Akin in, in, in the McLaren was, was well ahead and out of reach. And I was on a different strategy than Michael. Michael actually was not fighting against me in the track position, but we came up um, after pit stop. I came up with him. And there was three cars in front of me who I lapped. And Michael was behind me and I thought, okay, he's not racing me. He will not make a silly move. So I didn't really close the door, but I had to queue up for the three guys I lapped. He made a move. He touched me. This moment, I thought, no, I'm not going to let him get away with that. Was it a big hit? Not a big hit, a little kiss. But anyway, it just <laughs> set me off saying, okay, I have to now stand my ground here. And uh, re overtook him into the next corner on, on a place where normally no one overtakes. And uh, anyway, it, it was just what you do by instinct. And then going in the next corner, then I had a weakness, which normally you would protect the inside line so he can't do a counter move. But I wanted to show the great Michael Schumacher that I don't care. And I opened the door because if I would have pulled away the move with opening the door, he would have really been angry. And that was uh, my weakness that I wanted to provoke this. And I didn't calculate that he is already at this time very angry that he has to fight with me, that his race was not really for a podium. And then he re-overtook me in anger knowing actually it can't work. So we both collided. He instantly retired with a uh, broken suspension, but he damaged my suspension, which in uh, the next lap collapsed in the tunnel. When I turned through the tunnel, suspension collapsed. Left, right, left, right, left, right. There was nothing left on the car and I came out of the tunnel. I was still steering, but there was no wheels on the you wagon. Actually, what you <laughs> How scary was that? I wasn't scary at all, um, because the moment you impact, you know you're okay. Uh, it was just, I was furious with the lost opportunity of uh, finishing P2 in Monaco with a, uh, you know, underdog car. What was it like to race Schumacher, though, as a, as a young guy? Did you get off on that a bit? Was he, was he a hero growing up? Uh, no, he wasn't my hero. Um, he was a generation after where I looked up and had heroes, but I don't have one specific hero. I have a lot of drivers I look up to and try to always pick up their strengths. 
but of course I had full respect of Michael and at the time when I came in he was very supportive um, he sometimes took me uh, in his uh, private plane which me queuing up on the economy ticket usually um, was sensational we went to do some training together we went to play football together uh, I started with rock climbing and I showed him how cool rock climbing is and what great training it is for, for race drivers so we spent a bit of time together but then between those incidents on track and the crashing and also a bit of disagreements within the GPD, the Grand Prix Drivers Organization, um, we kind of stopped that friendship. We always respected each other, but it wasn't anymore that we call each other to do some training or football. Wow. So how did the Benetton years come to an end? It came to an end after the three years as, as I mentioned before Flavio came back as a team boss I was uh, then too stubborn to, to sign over um, my management to him by the time I split it with my own manager and decided to do it all myself and um, wanted to have a clean and fresh start and said okay I need to find a neutral home where I couldn't go and progress I had various offers of middle class team or lower teams but none of the top teams. But Ron Dennis offered me a, a role as test driver for McLaren. And I said, okay, I will accept to be a test driver. So I'm stepping off a racing seat. But my goal was to show them my capacities and capabilities and then later land the race seat with McLaren. And I banked on this strategy to work out, to actually sit in one of the best teams. Uh, and in retrospect, it didn't work out, but never mind. Did, did Ron know that that's what your goal was? Yeah, of course. You told him? Yeah, we spoke about I, it. Yeah. I will step back from a race seat to do this because I want to be Hakkinen's teammate or... Exactly. Uh, and he was perfectly fine. He said, if in the meantime you put the team first, but of course look after your own interest, but you have to work hard with us. Please impress us, but be very good in testing and um, be our reserve driver. There was a lot of work with testing, but traveling around the world for the sponsors. So, Did you get frustrated at not racing? I got frustrated because, look, I went in in the second year, I think, with testing. Don't forget, we've been on all the big tracks every week. I broke more than 27 lap records. Um, it was extremely fast. By that time, Adrian Newey and uh, Martin Wittmer, who was... Uh, team boss at the time below Ron Dennis they, they basically said look we want to put you into the race car so I was I was super motivated and uh, at one point also they told me I will race in the next season so I got so excited that they said they took the option on me but then at the same time when they took the option on me Ron Dennis uh, had understood he could sign Kimi Raikkonen and basically he then had to decide to keep me in the car as promised by the contract or, or go for Kim. It was a matter of a few hours and this was an extremely utterly frustrating moment in life that someone handed you the, the cookies and then just took it away because my entire strategy was to sit in the McLaren to race and be able to race for the world championship and somehow Ron decided uh, Kimi will be the, uh, the better bet and he went this direction. So I felt let down, but I'm not stupid either. It's like, okay, he's acting in the best interest of his team. Of course, you feel angry, and there was a few words I don't want to repeat here. Um, and he kept the contract on me. And the more frustrating part was that I had a great offer to go to Jagger at the time. It was not the best team at the time, but upcoming. I would have been teammate with Mark Weber, and I liked Mark a lot. You know, we were friends. Uh, there was a cool team boss there, Tony Panel, sensational personality, Dave Pitchford as a technical director. And they really made an effort to get me. And Ron would, despite not putting me in his car, also would not release me because I said, look, Alex, you're so important to us. You're a key ingredient for our success. Whilst he increased my salary to before unforeseen levels for test drivers. Um, so I definitely earned more bucks than many of the race drivers. But I didn't care about that. I, I got really angry at, in this situation. And yeah, it still makes me a 
a little bit angry. But anyway, I, I understand what he was coming from. And it was, was a shame, one of those moments. Weren't you being linked to Ferrari at one point as well? I can't remember when it was, but I remember there was a Ferrari link with you. Am I right? Yeah, no, you're absolutely what, right. I what year are we talking? You, we talk in the end of year 98. So okay, so it was a bit year, earlier than this. Yeah, a yeah. bit earlier, but again, I've, I was like the, the new little kid on, on the block because of all those great races and stories. And I had to go to Ferrari. You went to Maranello? I went to Maranello to meet Sean Dott in the villa. But in order to meet him, they asked me to stop at this petrol station. Then I have to get in someone else's car. It will be whatever color and brand. Then they're driving me to a different coffee shop. I changed car again because they were so paranoid that people, the, the paparazzis, uh, follow, follow us. That, and they didn't want any rumors to be out there. And then finally arrived in the villa and we, we spoke about uh, the contract and the offer. But silly me at the time, I felt very loyal to the team, to Benetton, to my contract, to Flavio. And uh, at this time, I, I just said, no, I want to, uh, I will honor my contract. So maybe let's talk after the next two years. And looking back, that really hurts. <laughs> I can I see in your face that you think God. I'm crazy. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Was it a too, race yeah. seat? Were they offering you a race seat? Yeah. So you could be, what, I suppose it was Barrichello's seat? No, it was Irvine's. Was it Irvine's seat? Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah, in, in French, you would say, c'est la vie. Well, you can. Well, that's <laughs> yeah. a nice way of putting it, isn't it? I mean, crikey. We'll get back to Alex in just a minute. But first, a question. Would you believe me if I said I knew of an all-in-one business solution to help you grow your online presence no matter what size your enterprise somewhere where you could access advanced business features to help you automate your work and boost productivity and built-in task management and reminder tools that could help you manage your workflow and hit deadlines? No? Well, you should. Because if you need help in any of these areas, then Wix could be just what you need to help your business flourish. If what you need is to build customer relationships and streamline user experience of your website, then Wix can help you add a chat function so you send messages to customers in real time. With Wix, you'll get all the tools you need to create the website and the business you want. Get started by going to Wix.com. That's Wix, W-I-X.com forward slash grid to get 10% off. Wix.com forward slash grid to get 10% off. Now let's get back to Mr. Verts. Well, uh, you did race for McLaren. Well, actually, no, before we talk about the race for McLaren, let's talk about this MP4 18A. Sensational car, Adrian Newey. It was lighter, smaller, everything, wasn't it? First question... You, you were the first guy to drive that car, but it wasn't until May 2003. Why was it so late? So Mercedes and McLaren at the time decided to enter into the completely new level of car design. And the MP4 18, as it was called, it never raced, by the way. Um, it was really some design features which you can still find on cars now. It, you know, it, it was way out there, but it was far technology was not ready for this type of design concept and it just kept breaking, you know, but such a big fuss was made about that car because at the time it was definitely the most expensive car ever being designed and built. I remember they flew the car in with a massive plane. It was followed by camera crews. Um, we had to all wait in Paul car. We saw the plane landing. We had to wait for the camera crews to be in place. I was the first one in the car. I was already sitting in the car. Ron Dennis called me to come out and said, Alex, you're making history here. You know, It was this whole build-up, actually really crazy. And when I drove out and the first few laps, it's like, to be honest and fair, I, I don't feel the lap time here. You know, so Did you feel that immediately? Yeah, very quickly, you know. So then you don't want to let that whole process and this whole hype go down. So I pushed like, can, like never in my life before really for a test day to just be a half a tenth faster than uh, my good friend, dear friend, Pedro de la Rosa in the standard McLaren car, the 17. And it was, hey guys, I'm not so sure about that car. And then very quickly we started to see a lot of faults and things kept breaking and 
braking and we had big accidents with this car. No race driver wanted to test it anymore. And it came to one point, my only time in my racing career where I refused to drive a car and that was the last lap of, the, of that 18 car. Okay, so first of all, why wasn't it quick? Because as you said, there was a massive song and dance about it. Was there just a fundamental design issue that Adrian had overlooked? It was just too lightweight. So everything kept flexing and bending. Um, I had four times in, in, in one death day losing my front wheels because all the uprights were so soft that the wheel nut couldn't be strong enough to withstand the loads. Uh, aerodynamic parts like the floor, the wings, uh, for some sort of load they were okay and then just a bit of overload. Things kept breaking. And honestly, the amount of accidents, but big accidents I had with this car was, was, was frightening. Oh God, can we talk about one of them? Because I said I wanted to talk to you about two accidents. One was that one with Schumacher and Monaco. The other one was in this MP418 at Paul Ricard. I think still the fastest ever crash in Formula One history, probably. What happened? Yes, uh, actually, I now spoil your story. And I'm so happy I found that you're not well prepared enough for this. The accident in Paul Ricard. As you said, well over 300 kilometers an hour, fastest crash, a driver walked away uninjured in Formula 1. What a sad record to have. Uh, it was in the 17 car and it was a tire mistake. They mounted the tire the wrong way around. So it wasn't the MP418? No, it wasn't the 18, yeah. Uh, in the 18, I had a lot of accidents in Paul Ricard because, for example, it kept blowing up the engine and then the Conrad went through the bottom and the brake line was there. So when you had an engine failure, you had no more brakes either. And I had a few times just going with no more brakes after engine blew up. But when the engine blew up at 250, 260 on the straight, usually at high revs, then suddenly you have no more brakes. So the amount of shunts we had in this car, you know, was just frightening thinking back about it. And then what about this shunt in the 17 then, the 300 Ks? Yeah, that was, um, was a scary shunt, to be honest, very honest. Um, I set a few lap records uh, that day and then I knew I had this test tire coming up. And it was the softest compound from Michelin. And, you know, for me, one of the most capable companies in, in motor racing. And I went very slow on my outlap, soft compound. Wanted to put another lap record on the table just for my ego, of course. That's what we race drivers do. <laughs> 27 the, lap records. And the <laughs> first um, corner in Paul Ricard, we did the fast chicane. And on the exit, the first rear load came onto the left rear tire at uh, 320 and it just instantly gave up because it was mounted against its driving direction and uh, it was directional tires at the time and then the rear uh, of course exploded it turned left crashed into the rail guard which is very close to the track there impact straight in with over 300 and it was the exact same position on the meter where Elio De Angelis died many years earlier on the Friday the 13th and the people on the track the track manager thought, when they saw the images on CCTV, Gerard Neveu, he told me, he thought, I'm dead. Because it was an explosion of the car. Uh, bits flew away. I impacted first with the front. And then by instinct, after a crash as a driver, you jump on your brake because you want to slow down. So you're out of control. So I'm trying to jump on the brake, but... There was no more brake because the whole front of the car was gone. It was just gone. But I was still spinning very fast with no more wheels on the car, on the floor uh, of the car. You slide over the asphalt. You don't decelerate well. And I'm spinning and spinning and spinning. I think they counted over 30 spins. And I knew I have no monocoque in front of my knees. And I was sliding still very fast head on against the next wall. And all I did was praying that I don't impact legs first. I impacted rear first, unbuckled my seatbelt, stepped out and uh, I had no injury, anything. But I was at this moment, I was really afraid to basically just crush my legs. How did that accident change your attitude towards safety? And, and I mean, at that point, I think you're a married man. Had you had your first son at that point or not? No, I didn't have my kids yet. Anyway, look. Did the, it change your attitude? No. No, I mean, look, I'm not suicidal or anything, and I knew it was a mistake. I have to say, the director of Michelin understood it was his mistake, a mounting mistake, which can happen. They didn't like it that it happened. They flew to my home, came for a meeting, they apologized for it. 
they paid all the crash and this showed us the system they will put in place that this will not happen in the future. And, you know, it's like, how, how cool is that? That someone admits a mistake uh, and tells you the process will be updated and changed. And this is what I learned in motor racing, that people take the safety extremely serious and look to crash with over 300 kilometers an hour and you, you walk away uninjured is, is sensational. So I was never really afraid in a race car. And also this accident didn't change uh, the, the driving or the risk taking you, you, you have to do in, in racing. So to take it in, in, in chronological order, 2005, Red Bull come into Formula One. They buy Jaguar, the team that you could have raced for but didn't. So the team is now owned by an Austrian company. You're an Austrian racing driver, a very good one. Logic would dictate that you might have been one of the race drivers that year. Why not? Huh. Well, before Jaguar actually became Red Bull, the second time around, Donny Bernal from Jaguar tried to hire me. And at this point, Ron Dennis released me in a meeting I had to go to Jaguar. That was uh, in the winter 2004-2005. Last minute, he stops the release of the contract for the same thing again. No, Alex, you stay with us. But by that time, I couldn't keep a straight face anymore. I, I lost it. But anyway, he, he stopped the move to Jaguar. And interestingly, he told all the engineers that I will be gone. So then they designed the car, not anymore for me, for my size. But I stayed with McGarren. And that was the reason, for example, I couldn't replace Juan Pablo Montoya in the race because they designed me out of the car, but the team boss didn't let me go. And, and by this point, I got really angry with the whole setup and with, with Ron Dennis. So why did Ron stop, stop you making the move for a second time? How did he justify that? Still amazed about that. Doesn't Had he got wind that Red Bull were getting involved and he saw them perhaps as more of a threat than Jaguar were? Or? Honestly, Tom, uh, I, I still don't know, and um, it happened. So I couldn't join the Jaguar team, and Tony Panel already was aware of, of, of the move, and he will be the first Red Bull team boss. He then, still in 2006, tried to convince uh, Red Bull and Mateschitz to, to, to sign me, because he knew all of the Michelin tire data, and Michelin said, look, the guy was fast, he was faultless in, in, in feedback and so on. But it didn't work out because somehow you would think Austrians stick together, but actually we, we don't really stick together. So I was never a Red Bull uh, driver and um, it just didn't happen. Well, look, you stay at McLaren and you do replace Montoya for Imola 2005 and you finish third. Well, actually, you finish fourth on the road, don't you? Um, just your memories of that weekend and getting racing again. It had been a while. Just how exhilarating was it? It's been a while, but I was full of anger, to be honest. Because don't, don't forget, at this time, I should have been at, at the Jaguar team. Uh, they designed me out of the car. So the first chance when Montoya broke his shoulder, I wasn't in the car. It was uh, Pedro de la Rosa. Again, you know, he's an extremely good friend of mine, one of my best friends. We still hang out together uh, on most of our holidays. But... I had the first ride on the reserve seat and I didn't fit the car because the engineers were told, don't worry about Alex, he's gone to Jagger, so don't design the car for him. So I was really angry because of the legal situation. I had the first ride. Then they knew they have to change the car. It cost them an arm and a leg to modify the car in such a short period of time. So I was a bit angry. Um, maybe not... Uh, very mature at that moment. I grew my hair very long because I know it upsets Ron. <laughs> I remember. But it was my little revenges. <laughs> I, I needed just to, to get it out of my system. The race itself was pretty good. Um, I knew it, it is a difficult weekend for the team in any case. I kept my head down. I pushed very hard. I finished fourth uh, in the race and um, Jensen Button was disqualified for a legal fuel tank in his team and then so I finished third in, in this race and uh, I, I was very happy and pleased with that result. And did that sort of whet your appetite again for racing and is that why you then went to Williams for 2-7 because you just wanted to race again? Yeah, so with all the anger I had about this not being released 
Um, I hung it out a bit too much. Then Ron realized, okay, I'm not a good asset anymore because my mindset is, is too angry. I couldn't move on. And so I, I needed to go. And I was prepared to just actually stop or pause my F1 career and go into any other sort of racing. And then had a winter um, where actually nothing came up, you know, no opportunities whatsoever. I said, okay, that was my racing career. And then I got the last minute phone call from Frank Williams uh, in December of 2006, where he asked me to come to Grove, to his team, uh, just to talk. Why did that remind me, that sort of situation? So Weber was leaving and what he just... Did Weber put in a good word for you? Or how no, did... Mark was still there. It was 2006. They had Mark Weber and Nico Rosberg as a new arrival. But he said, look, I know you are sensational in developing the cars. I can't offer you a race seat, but I can offer an opportunity. Uh, it's late in the season. He realized I have nowhere to go. And um, he really said, look, I need to show to my, to my team... We are serious, we have a lot of testing, you are the best, you are available, so I, I need to sign you. And uh, I went over, it was quite a funny meeting actually to meet Sir Frank and, and, and uh, Patrick. And it ended up me uh, signing up as a test driver for one year. And then of course you go racing, was it a, was it a, were you surprised to get that race seat? I was of course hoping for the race seat. Um, again, throughout that year, uh, I did very fast lap times. By that time, I must be honest, I was hoping that going racing, my instinct and my passion would be flaming up again. Because with all these years of being in the test seat and having had a few options to race but didn't happen, I got a little bit disillusioned, maybe lost a little bit the edge and the love got too angry with the whole situation. And I was thinking, hey, look, I go back racing and it will, will be there again. And it wasn't. And that really did my head in. I could be extremely fast in racing. You know, was Nico Rosberg, my teammate, in, teammate. in racing average times, I was faster than him. I had the highest amount of overtakes in the, in the season of 2007 of anyone in the, in the field. But I struggled in qualifying. Um, I didn't like the tires back then, but I couldn't change my driving style. And all of these subjects I thought I should master, and I didn't. And now I know it because the fire wasn't there. And something got a little bit killed in me over these years of testing and the frustration of being close to a drive at McLaren, having it taken away, two times having a great contract with a team fully on the rise, being neglected to, to go and then just uh, mentally put his car. So Canada, great moment. You finished third, having driven an amazing race. Actually, wasn't it? It was. Um, did you almost? I mean, because you actually didn't finish the season. Did you? Was Was there a tiny bit of you that thought I finished on the podium? I could almost walk away now. No. Well, I wanted to finish the season, but on the Saturday night in Canada, after uh, very average qualifying with a gearbox problem, was. I think 17th or 19th on the grid. Anyway, far from where I wanted to be. I called my wife and I said, look, uh, if fire is not coming, I think in the end of the season I will retire. She said, well, if you feel like this, not retire fully, I wanted to go back to sports car racing to Le Mans. And um, I spoke with Frank about it, not on that Saturday, uh, but I started speaking with him about it. And he said, please finish the season. Because he didn't see that the fire wasn't there. Because in races, you know, I had uh, fourth place finishes, I had the podium. But that night in, in Canada, I decided to call it a quit on F1. And then the next day, you know, it was a difficult race, it was a crazy race. It, re it required enormous amount of tire management. And that's my skill. And in the end, I finished third. So, uh, you know, a little present of... of of someone up there of the racing god or whoever you believe in it was a nice moment I had good races after you know sensational battle on Nürburgring in a wet race we finished fourth in the Constructors Championship which for Williams at the time was coming from seventh or eighth really getting back alive so great time you know but I knew deep inside I'm only capable of 99% and it I didn't even, want it 
I didn't want that. I wanted to be 100%. The fire wasn't there. I called it a day. But that podium, even that podium, didn't reignite the fire no. completely. Not to the level I expect of mine. Not to the level I was used to of myself in BMX racing, in Formula Ford, or in all the other moments in Formula One when when this, this mindset was crystal clear on the target. I didn't have that anymore. And then I was honest to myself. It was a good year, you know. I mean... Again, points-wise, uh, results-wise, lap time-wise in the races, feedback, everyone was happy, but I was just like, no, it's not me, so called it uh, time out. The last race then went to Katsuki Nakajima because Frank had asked me if, if I would give that up. I didn't really want to, but then he forced me to. Um, never mind, I fully understand that when someone says he's going, he used that race to test Nakajima out in the end. So a slightly frustrating end to the racing career in Formula One. Not frustrated, just honest, you know. Um, Was that one of your biggest strengths, the fact that you were so honest with yourself? In retrospect, maybe. At the time, I felt it more like a weakness and uh, didn't really see the big picture here. But I, will, I said, look, I, if, if it's not 100% against the best in the world, you will not succeed bad luck, career didn't start that great, you know, uh, didn't end as, as expected, you know. But sometimes you're a little bit lucky and sometimes you're a bit unlucky and so my, my career was a bit unlucky on this side and and um, that was it. So I'm really not angry about it. Looking back, actually, it made me a stronger person overall. How did you find the years with Honda and th that followed? Yeah, well, actually, I, I wanted to get really out of F1 that's what I'm surprised yeah. so you, you, you've run and the wife and said I'm getting out of Formula 1 but then and I I had no intention at all to remain involved in F1 and at this time the Le Mans series the 24 hour race with the prototypes of Audi battle against Peugeot those cars looked so cool so sexy and it's very heroic form of racing and I agreed with Peugeot um, quite similar timing to the Canada race, but this whole decision making came up that they would sign me if, if I commit. And every time I thought about it, I felt like a young BMX kid again. The love came up, the fire was there. What was it about sports car racing that, that reignited the fire that Formula One couldn't do? Uh, maybe less pressure in, in retrospect, but you know what it was? When I was a young kid, I went to a motor show. And someone asked me if I want to sit into one of the Group C in the spot prototypes. And I sat in, they closed the door, and it's a closed cockpit for those uh, listeners who don't, un don't know what the Le Mans cars were, the spot prototypes. And it became silent. And I was on this monster of a machine, more than 1,000 horsepower. I knew they go 400 kilometers an hour in Le Mans. And I'm sitting in this capsule of silence. And that was a moment, since then I was in love with this whole sports car racing and the idea of endurance racing of 24 hours competing. And whenever I thought about it, it was a happy thought, which F1 didn't fulfill anymore. And then those sports cars came up again after a bit of a recession on the sports cars industry. And suddenly this, this fire, this passion, this childhood dream was there. And then I knew I go in there, I will be that personality which I want to be, which is very crystal clear, focused on one target. You're still involved with Toyota now. Um, and what, a few weeks back, Alonso won his second Le Mans with you guys. Um, how have you found Alonso to work with? What's impressed you about him? So Fernando, I know since a while, of course, from Formula One. Sensational driver, extremely skilled. Um, and by chance, we, 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 we spoke about it. You know, I raced for Toyota and decided to stop uh, racing overall. Uh, had a good career, a lot of wins in, in sports cars in the end, you know, fast lap times, sensational races. So I was very happy. I felt fulfilled and, uh, t and remained with Toyota as a sporting ambassador. And Fernando had plans to go to race in Le Mans. He didn't know that there is an availability at, at Le Mans, so we talked. Um, and um, I helped him to go in touch with, uh, with the Toyota management, helped to manage this contract being actually uh, signed. And because I stay with the team and Fernando understood 
that have a lot of knowledge about the tires, the way how you drive a hybrid machine, how you race in Le Mans. Um, we worked very well together at the beginning and it wasn't the easy start for him, to be honest. Uh, to go after so many years of just single-seaters, racing also with the Pirelli tire, which is very different to the Michelin tire we race. It's a bit like comparing some tennis players playing on sand, uh, on clay, against grass. Very different timing and, and completely different sensations. And uh, it was not easy for him at the first few tests and even the first race. And uh, I was amazed how hard he works on it, how self-critical he was, how hungry after so many successful years in F1 he was still to master and beat each and every other one on the track. And I have realized that this person has an amazing amount of fire. He has like this nuclear engine built in, which determination, uh, which I have not seen on anyone. And he made it work and he became such a strong endurance racer, which you need to be a team player. You need to work with your teammates. But of course, you have to be very fast and faultless over, over a long period of time. And so he became a double Le Mans winner within just two years. And do you respect him more now as a result of what you've seen in these two years in sports cars more than you did before? Yeah, I mean, I respected him extremely before, so don't get me wrong, but the insight uh, I gained, which is especially to that nuclear engine, I can only say it again, he has insight of this determination, which is fascinating. And along my racing career, I've seen on myself, I've seen with other extremely talented people that we have fluctuations. And if the fluctuations are a little bit too big, like myself or other guys, we have sensational races, show amazing skills. But on the low side, not good enough. Let's be honest, against the world's best, not good enough. And there are those few drivers Every day, every lap, every corner, every meter of a track will always manage to be at their maximum. And those are the multiple world champions. Those are the Hamiltons, those are the Schumachers, those are the Senners, the Jackie Stewarts, the Nicky Lauders, and those are the Fernando Alonso's. And he is a driver at every car, every tire, every race situation, every different category. He's giving it all every millimeter of his life. And that's what I've learned to appreciate with him, despite him being very difficult at times and edgy. But yeah, uh, I pull my head off of those multiple champions because this is a skill which is sensational. Alex, you're a man who understands racing drivers so well. I mean, just listening to you describe Fernando Alonso there. So, you know, you're chairman of the GPDA and you have been for, what, five years now. You are the perfect man for that job. Is it something that you enjoy? <laughs> the GPDA job is a love and hate relationship. So for those who don't know, the GPDA is the Grand Prix Drivers Association. is one of the oldest um, entities you have in motor racing other than the FIA. And we are here originally for the safety of Formula One. As the safety anyway is an industry yeah, given nowadays of how safe racing has become and still gets with amazing technologies and knowledge. The GPD is also now branched out to be, and our hashtag line would be for our fans, for our sport and our safety. So not only more safety, we, we want to be helpful for the sport, which occasionally makes decisions which maybe are not optimum uh, to find its best way forward to adopt to a new consumer behavior, to new way of sport is perceived and consumed, to an overload of entertainment we have in the world. The sport has to change, maybe not change, but adapt to this new situation, new consumer behavior. And we want to be helpful to the sport we love. And that's, that's the GPD and this is why I'm still doing it. I feel very privileged that the drivers ask me to, to lead them. Um, we have a hundred percent of membership, which yeah, has How did happened. you manage that? <laughs> <laughs> how did you manage to get them all on board? Who was uh, it? Kimmy, was it? <laughs> yeah. No, there were, uh, because we entered a, a few years of a wrong culture 
And I'll tell you very simple, is we had GPDA meetings, which even the non-members, before there were a few non-members, they joined because, of course, they understand that when the drivers, they need to be united uh, at certain times. And also in a way they respect me, so I asked them to stay even so they didn't pay their membership fee, because you have to pay as a Formula One driver, you have to still pay a membership fee for the GPDA. But the meetings were the only time where there was no one in the room other than the 20 or 22 drivers. So the forum sometimes became the fighting ground of egos which crashed on the track to then talk it out. And I realized that this creates a wrong culture and a wrong environment. And I then said to everyone, look, this forum is not to have disagreements. This forum is only to have agreements and way forward where we can help our sport to be even more popular and even bigger than it already is. And everyone somehow in personal conversations understood that. And everyone also understands that the sport is standing in front of key decisions and that the drivers have a completely unbiased, neutral view of, of the sport because we entered it not for business reasons. We entered it because it's our love, our passion. So we want only the best for it. And in the end, suddenly I had 100% of members and they, 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 they really appreciate uh, the GPD and uh, I feel very privileged to, to be their representative um, and hope to be seen helpful for the future of Formula One racing. Fantastic. So, Alex, you're doing that. You do Austrian TV. You've got your track design business going on. Um, what else? <laughs> How, is there any free time left? I don't know. Just tell us a little bit more about what you're up to. Oh, I suppose there's Toyota, of course. With yeah. The... I used to work for Williams until uh, this winter for seven years. I've been an advisor to the board, helped them on all the recruiting and strategic decisions, also on sporting matters on track. I had a sensational time there, you know, f um, really appreciate the team. Of course, uh, Frank, Patrick, every single employer is very close to my heart. I had a great time with, with Claire and Michael Driscoll who are leading the team. Um, they let me be involved in each and everything. Uh, small little thing which nev has never been disclosed here, so it's a world exclusive for you, Tom, that in this whole tire war, with the Pirelli tires, you needed to bring the front tires up to great temperature and you cool the rears. At one point, as <laughs> a funny thing, I was standing at home, bought a new kitchen and I had inductor blades cooking. And I thought, hang on a minute, if I can heat with inductors my cooking pan, I can use inductors to heat up the rims of the car and that heat in the rim will go into the tire and heat my tire faster. So I went to the technical director. I said, that's what we should do. It is legal by the rules. That's what Williams did. And it helped us a great deal in, in some of the races. Then other teams, of course, understand about it until James Ellison, who was still at Ferrari, um, asked if that system is now legal or not. It was in a zone of the rules which was never... Uh, considered that sort of rim heating system and then it was stopped so I love how you uh, stumbled across that <laughs> yeah no me too uh, and I, I rarely cook by the way <laughs> um, I made an omelette but from all the years of tire testing and just creative thinking um, I was involved in Williams on, on all ends and it, it was sensational but time came to a natural end uh, I focused fully on, on my track design business so it's the track design business that's that's keeping you busy. When are we going to see Formula One at one of your racetracks? Yeah, before I talk about the pinnacle of racing Formula One, just to give you a little background, my, my dad started after his uh, career finished a uh, road safety business. From a one-man show, it became an operation which uh, brings out driver trainings in some nations, mandatory by law, uh, his road safety programs have helped to reduce fatalities, for example, in Austria or Switzerland or Luxembourg by more than 30%. Uh, so you talk of something extremely serious. Uh, Test and Training is the company. Our system has now trained over 5 million drivers, more than 4 million children, because we have uh, road safety programs for every age group, for every vehicle. 
we work for governments, for automobile clubs uh, all around the world. And my, my dad started this. But to train people, he also designed, specially designed driver training facilities. And in order to do that, he needed someone to design it, but he found no one. So he started to also do his own facility design. For so example, we're sitting here in Austria, the Red Bull Ring. It was the government who gave my dad the order to transform it into what it is now. Don't forget, it was before called the A1 Ring, before Didi Mateschitz bought it. So everything you see here, for example, is already somehow creation of my dad's company. So, just so your dad turned this place from the, the old Osterreicher Ring into the A1 Ring. That, yes. When did we first come here? 97 or something, was it? Or? Uh, no, later. Was I it think, later? Yeah, I think 99. Okay, so it's your dad designed this racetrack. Yeah, yeah, there is, this is a photo where he uh, cuts the ribbon of the new track. He got the order from the government. Uh, he put in place the operating company. My uncle, Hans Geist, he, because my dad was very busy running this bigger uh, road safety company. That was just as uh, the daughter company, but under full control of, of, of the mother company. And uh, so he initiated it. It is a great business model because it's not only racetrack, it also has the driver training facility. So it works great for events, for incentives, car presentation. And it was always a profitable business here. So are all the other 43 facilities. My company now, Test and Training, has designed. We're giving the operating model. And in in this process, a, one person joined the team, was Hermann Tilke, and he became then a big track designer for one simple reason. I mean, A, he knows what he's doing, or you would think so. And um, he spoke English, my dad didn't speak English. So my, uh, my father sent Hermann to have all the meetings with, with Bernie, and then Bernie started to, to like Tilke. And so he started his business based on, on, on that. He started in, in my father's company which then later with the money I made, my dad sold it all to the Austrian Automobile Club, I bought it back and I decided to go back into uh, design business and cooperated with Hermann Dilke for a long time. He subcontracted me, for example, the, the track in Austin. I helped him to design it. I used a simulator, which was not seen before, to design a track on the simulator. Um, I paid for it and um, then somehow I said, you know what, I do it all myself. And now we offer solutions from A to Z for, for racetrack design, from the architecture all the way, for, uh, starting with feasibility studies, master planning, detail planning, tendering process, helping the clients to find the right contractor, quality control, site supervision, and which no one in the world in racetrack design can do is because we have operating experience. We know how important it is that the facility is operator-friendly. And not only for racing, mainly for your everyday business where you generate your income, which is your motorsport clubs, your incentives and events. So, When you're designing a track, do you design it with Formula One in mind? Is there a particular category that you have in mind? This would work for Formula One or you just have to think much broader than that? No, you have to think much broader. I'll give you an example. If you design a track and you don't have it in mind for a specific racing category, let's say Formula One or MotoGP, and you have a track where it is mainly living from corporate events, you design the track very different. I'll give you an example. A long straight with a hairpin in a normal road car, if you push very hard after three laps, the brakes are dead. So if it's a motorsport club, you know, and not everyone in the world is super rich and can afford a few thousand euros worth of brakes after a few laps. Well, I designed the track then with very low brake energies, so long corner entries, so it touches the brake only so the brakes won't get hot and be destroyed. Same goes for the asphalt. No one wants to have one set of tires being ripped apart in five, six laps. F1 racers want to have a high grip, so if you design a pure F1 track, I will give uh, the order for different stones and different grip levels. But if it's a track maybe more for everyday business, I will use a much less abrasive stone, still offering a better grip, but not ripping the tires apart. So that comes because we are coming from the operating side. Because I know the client has to be happy to come back and spend not only once a year his 
hard earned money, but two, three, four times a year. Um, and I only tell you now a little bit, which I'm not afraid that the other designers hear, but some of them don't even consider that. Um, and so every project is very unique. There's not one property in the world where you can just put a circuit on you have in mind. You know, every property tells you a different story. It depends on the wind, on the sun, on the soil conditions, uh, where the main entries are, where you have space for the bit building, overall concept, the ideas of the investor. So it's just, there's not one thing which is the same than and, in any other trick. And I guess runoff is totally dictated by who the client is as well. You want tarmac runoff if it's a corporate thing, whereas, is that right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, the debate on asphalt runoffs. Where are you on that debate? I, I, I think I have started the entire debate. i tell you asphalt runoff, if you are an architect, a designer who comes in and lives on percentage on the construction cost, of course you're going to do everything in asphalt runoff areas because A, it's more expensive, B, you need bigger bump stations, so you have much more design to do and uh, it will be more expensive, so your income will be better. I don't work on that, I work on flat fee, and I'm a purist, because, um, so this is how we ended up with asphalt runoff areas. It looks more beautiful, there's less dust in the air, but it became too clinic, and we have this track limit abuse, which I'm not a, a, a big fan. So A, I'm a safety fan, I don't want to contradict myself, but uh, asphalt runoff areas on braking straight in makes absolute sense. We know it slows down the cars the most. It's no, we know that when you spin sideways with no wheels on the car, you don't roll like in a gravel bed. So it's the most safest form. But once I'm in a corner and my trajectory is kind of done, the car has no technical failures, broken wing or puncture or anything on the turning. On the exit, I'm under control where I end up. And we are talking of a precision sport. But where is the precision if I can put my car 10 centimeters, 50 centimeters, one meter, three meters behind the, the curb? That's not a precision sport, in my opinion. And drivers need instant consequence of a millimeter mistake they're doing. And therefore, asphalt runoff errors on 80% on corner exits are misplaced because we are going against that precision sport which fascinates the people at home that I can control a slide of 300 kilometers an hour but what's I don't need to do it now. Alex huh? what's the answer then on corner exit? The answer would be eight in the track design that you take care that you don't your trajectory is not the decisive moment on the exit curb it should be before you can design a corner like this not always possible um, if it's purely about F1 and the that precision sport element counts. Um, nothing is wrong with grass. Um, I would love it. That right up to the edge of the curb. Right up to the edge of the curb. But, now is the great but, I'm coming from the operating side, is that's really bad for everyday operation. That's MotoGP, don't like that. So you have so many compromises in life. Um, so there is not a simple answer, of course not. And... Can we ask now all the tracks which asphalted for hundred thousands of euros to take away the asphalt? That would also seem a bit unfair. So it is a longer debate. I have some solutions. I showed it to some drivers. They love it. Um, but I don't know. I'm not going to tell you that solutions <laughs> because I want to keep it for the first uh, yeah. words design tracks to come into play very soon. Alex, how fascinating to hear you talk and so passionately about track design. It's clearly the family business motorsport, isn't it? Your dad was involved, your uncle was involved. Look at what you're doing now and what you've achieved. What chance, Felix, Charlie or Oscar, following in your wheel tracks? <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean... Um, I mean, they're karting, right? Are they, are they? Yeah, Felix, my older son... He is unfortunately even taller than me, so cuddling him <laughs> uphill, a bit awkward. <laughs> He's 17. He's a really cool kid. I love him to, to bits. Sounds like a course. racing career is going to be difficult if he's even taller than you. Yeah, difficult. So in karting, he struggled. You know, we can see especially his car control is super good. So he went to the footsteps of my father, of his granddad. Uh, he's in rallycross in the national uh, category. You know, he's uh, learning, he has some podium finishes, some uh, heat wins. He's 
learning how to, to how rallycross works and um that's at the moment his direction i can see him very much also getting involved in the design business because when we renovated our house and i tell him look you're entering a door the door opens to the right so the light switch has to be on the left and all these little details and he remembers it and you know and he looks at it and sees that he has this network thinking and um yeah so maybe quite he, like his dad <laughs> so i hope he helps me in the business uh because single seaters will definitely be uh, in the current shape or form unfortunately impossible for him um we then have charlie and oscar those two are in karting um they are doing really well uh, last year they've won national championships austrian championship was a hungarian champion charlie is canadian champion oscar is so completely international completely international yeah we are a little bit crazy and nuts mm -hmm. so yeah we're a motorsport family and we the, all we talk about is tire pressures tires and and which airport is is better and nicer you know for traveling <laughs> to the international <laughs> racetracks of the world right see what a wonderful chat thank you so much for your time good luck to the lads in their future yeah. endeavors and to you really yeah, appreciate thank you very time. much and it's now time to wake up after <laughs> that conversation and for everyone to go back to hopefully a great day Alex has many sound opinions, doesn't he? I found myself nodding regularly while he spoke about the state of play in Formula One. But it was his racing stories that I loved the most, and there was so much in that chat that I didn't already know, and I've known Alex for 20 years. Frankly, I think I'll struggle to get the image of Flavio Briatore in a silk dressing gown out of my head. Thanks for your time, Alex, and good luck with everything that you've got going on in your world. I know you're a busy man. Well, that's it for this episode, but we'll be back next week with another big name from the world of Formula One. Until then, why not subscribe to Be On The Grid if you haven't already? We're on all of your favorite podcast apps, including Apple and Spotify. And thanks for your feedback about last week's episode with FIA President Jean Todd. What a fabulous career he's had. And many of you loved his story, particularly, it seems, what Jean has achieved outside of Formula One. That story about losing a car on the Dakar rally, priceless, says Hamish Campbell. There's a lot more to Todd than Ferrari in Formula One. Thanks for sharing. Couldn't agree more, Hamish. He's achieved an awful lot in his career. And if you look at his current work rate, he clearly thinks there's still a lot more to do. Please keep your feedback coming. We love it. And remember to use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid and you can tweet me at Tom Clarkson F1. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audioboom. Until next time, keep it flat out.